Well, it's Monday, so that means it's that time of the week. It's time for an OTRS Central Q&A video. Who's down? I hope you're down if you actually click down the damn video. All right. So thanks to those of you that tweeted your questions. At OTRS Central on Twitter is the Twitter handle. Please remember to use the hashtag OTRS Central when asking your questions. So that way I know that they're actually questions as I go through them. These questions haven't been pre-screened. So it'll be a little bit choppy maybe from time to time, but we'll get through it somehow. We'll see how many questions we get through. Make them good ones. I hope you did. Cricket Sam 64 asks, what can we realistically expect from an AJ Styles run in the WWE? Uh, I'm not expecting main event. I'd expect some type of mid-card run. Um, not quite sure. I think this sounds like a better idea to certain fans than it actually is in reality. Andrew Harrington asks, thoughts on the rumors that AJ Styles might be coming to the WWE? Kind of follows up with that previous question. And it's one of those things where he could cross it off the list, they can cross it off the list. I mean, there's a place for him, but I'm not going to push him to the moon. You know, maybe he'll move some, some merch. You know, he'll have an audience, so maybe he'll come in at least a little bit organically over. I'm just not convinced that the WWE will know what to do with him. I'm not sure that AJ Styles fits or is going to be comfortable with the WWE. It will be an interesting marriage for sure. I'm not sure that it will be a good one. I'm not sure if people are going to like the results. But in the meantime, if they send him down to NXT at all, which if you're AJ Styles, man, that's got to take a lot of swallowing of pride to do. You're fucking the phenomenal one AJ Styles, and you got to go to WWE's developmental territory. Ooh. Ooh. You know, if AJ Styles is coming, that means because he really wants to come, and that's a good first step. You'll know he wants to be there, if nothing else. Michael Capullo, what is one stipulation you would like to see happen in NXT? Um... Maybe at WrestleMania, you'd have a match, some type of battle royal type thing. You know, I know you're already doing the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal, so maybe it doesn't work there. I'd like to see maybe some type of golf match or something, somehow, some way, maybe a tournament in the weeks leading up to WrestleMania where it culminates on the WrestleMania pre-show and the winner of the match gets a roster spot on Raw in SmackDown. I think it would be a good way to make NXT's program maybe consequential in the lead-up to WrestleMania, uh, besides the NXT show that week, and that surely is going to happen. But it would be a way to, to introduce a whole new audience that doesn't pay attention to NXT and doesn't watch NXT to somebody that's coming up. You know, so that might be something I would like to see. Uh, let's see what else. Dexter Cumberbatch. Can Billary... Er, can Billary... Excuse me. Can Bernie Sanders beat Hillary Clinton? I think so. I know Debbie Wasserman Schultz and the Democratic National Committee most certainly don't want to envision that and don't want that to happen because it seems like they've really tried to learn from their mistakes of 2008 when they were trying to set it up for Hillary and here comes Barack Hussein Obama strolling right on through. So the deck is clearly stacked in Hillary's favor this time. However, I'd be stunned if Bernie didn't win Iowa's caucus. I'd be even more stunned if he didn't win the New Hampshire primary. So the first two states, you'd be looking at Bernie potentially being 2-0, and which is something that Barack didn't even do in 2008 running against Hillary. He won in Iowa, and then Hillary won in New Hampshire. You know, to me, it's going to come down to when you look at the Democratic primary side, it's going to come down to uh, not just states won, but this is something Barack Obama really understood, his campaign understood so very, very well in 2008. It's all about, on the Democratic side, those superdelegates. And what is Bernie Sanders' campaign's action plan to go get those super delegates? You know, they're not going to be able to beat Hillary in every state. So they have to make sure they have the proper ground game and infrastructure in those specific states. And another thing, when you're talking about the primaries, you know, I don't know that Hillary Clinton is going to excite the non white liberal vote. But I also don't know at this time if Bernie Sanders has come up with a way to reach out to that non-white liberal vote. I don't know if he's effectively bridging the gap and reaching out to the black voters and Hispanic voters that he needs to, even in the primary season. 
If he can't turn out those people in big abundance, if he can't turn out the young college kids in great abundance like Obama did for him in 2008, uh, then, then no, he can't. There's a shot, though. Because if he beats Hillary in Iowa, which I expect him to, I'd be stunned if he didn't, and then he comes back and beats her in New Hampshire, which I expect him to do as well, he will have won the first two states. Can't dismiss him anymore. The whole narrative shifts. The whole culture changes on the Democratic side. It's not just an automatic Hillary coronation anymore. Once you get to that point, anything is possible. And then he also asked, will Trump win the GOP nomination? We're going to find out. I think there's a chance. There's a very good chance. But you know it's a matter of if some of the establishment candidates drop off of the radar after the first couple of states, does somebody like a Marco Rubio get a big boost and does the establishment truly rally behind him and start plunking money into his efforts? And will that establishment be able to fend off Trump? You know, Trump's rise in the polls, his ability to sustain in the polls, you know, could be a bit misleading. I compare it somewhat to the hardcore wrestling fans. We have the loudest voices, so we sometimes think we are the only voices, but we are not. Now, we are a much smaller segment of the overall fan base of wrestling than we think we actually are. And for those Trump supporters, that could be something in play as well. It could be a bit of fool's gold, because when you're polling on a national basis in the primaries, that's not how you do it, and that doesn't really matter. It's not an effective sampling because the primaries are based off of something entirely different. It is truly done at a state-by-state -state level. So when you're polling individual states, you know, one state Trump could be doing outstanding in the next state, not so much. So it kind of can skew the numbers. I think Ted Cruz is legitimate at this point in time because it sounds like he's got a really good ground game going. He's one person that's not afraid of Donald Trump. I think everybody else on that side is a little bit of in fear of Donald Trump and afraid of pissing off his supporters. And for a while there, I thought Ted Cruz was as well. God help us all if he actually gets the nomination. But Ted Cruz is a formidable opponent for Donald Trump. Now that the Ben Carsons have dropped off and the Jeb Bushes are non-factors, you know, you're really looking at a three-horse race on the GOP side. It's Trump, it's Cruz, and Rubio in that particular order. Uh, let's see here. Diclonius Games, realistically, from a booking standpoint, who should win the Royal Rumble, thus becoming world champion? Realistically? Triple H. That makes sense from a booking standpoint. It's very realistic, and there are a lot of ways you can do it. I just don't like the thought of taking this stipulation for the Royal Rumble, putting the belt on the line, just to have Roman Reigns retain and walk out with the title. I just do not. And I understand some of the thought process of people, hey, you know, that means if he goes to WrestleMania, he'll already have been a three-time champion if he wins the belt there. And, you know, is it wise to just keep hot-shotting it on him just to drop it right back off of him? And that's a fair question. That's a fair argument to make. But on the flip side, if he doesn't lose it at the Rumble, then who the hell's ever going to beat him? You know? Uh, Luke Van Egerot. Is a mid-card match similar to HBK Y2J or HBK Angle possible at WrestleMania 32? Two got top guys, no belts, just ego. Who'd it be? I don't think you have that. You know, for a couple of years, I thought that match would have been a Daniel Bryan versus CM Punk, but obviously that's not going to happen for many different reasons. Um, I don't think you have that match on the card. I just do not see where you can have that match. It's a shame is I think WrestleMania is better when it has that type of match where it's just a personal issue, it's about who's better, and that's that. You just don't have that this year. I don't see the possibility for it. Um, let's see here. Andy99. Will the WWE hold a Big Four pay-per-view in the UK again? Um, I think so. I mean, they've dabbled with doing the Japan shows, and they've done those live. So I'd be surprised if sometime in the next 12, 18, 24 months we don't have a big four pay-per-view in the UK. They may try it out first with a smaller run pay-per-view. But at some point in time, there's going to be a big four pay-per-view there, I would have to think. Um, let's see here. The Ben Wardy, what do you think of midget wrestling? I, it's one of those things that has a place. You know, they used to refer to it as, if you want a human wrestling, that's what brought it. But... You know what? There could be an appeal there. There could be an attraction there. So so why not? They working hard. Yeah. You know, hornswoggle for champ. You know, and, and to be serious here for just a second, you're talking about guys that are small and guys that do spots and flips and kicks 
and don't talk on the micro. And you would think hardcore fans would love Hornswoggle. I just don't get why they don't. Uh, at WWE961 asks, so how does it feel to know the Hulkster retweeted you? He did. I'm dead serious. I did not know this. The Hulkster retreated me. Are you sure it wasn't a fake account? Let me let me look really quickly. Pop the works on the Q and A for a second. Let me take a look and see here. Got to scroll down through the Twitter interactions and mentions. And holy shit, brother! Let's see here. This must have been in response to the triple threat video. You were right, WWE 961. At Hulk Hogan tweets to me. Pretty wild and crazy and defiantly a renegade, but thanks for being on Team Hogan, my brother, only love for you. And he says, oh, and by the way, you would have been perfect color NWO back in the day. Well, let me tell you something, brother. That's one of the greatest things that's ever happened to me, dude. Ride or die, I'm always going to be Team Hogan, brother. Woo! I didn't know Hulk Hogan retweeted me. I guess I should pay more attention on Twitter. Holy shitballs. Yes, I'm geeking out for it. Yes, I can be excited about it. It even lets you know that even me, every once in a while, there can be that little nerdy kid fan inside of me, and that's one of them. That's the wrestling equivalent to me of Michael Jordan retweeting me if he even had Twitter. I've been doing this for over five years now. And it's like that's the walk-off shot. But sorry, I'm not going anywhere. Incredible. That's right, I would have been perfect back in the day. Ah, 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 ah. Defiantly a renegade. Stick that in your pipe and fucking smoke it. Oh. Oh. Because if somebody from ECW or something retweeted you, you wouldn't geek out for the shit either. Hey, Daniel Bryan said a nice beard, kid. And I wish he has he has. Yes, yes. Well, you're going to let me have my moment, and nobody can ruin it. Nobody. Let's see if we can move on. I just don't know if anything's going to measure up. Sorry, guys. Thank you, WWE961, for pointing that out. Because I seriously, legitimately didn't know. I pulled up to Twitter to do the Q&A, just clicked into the interactions, and just started scrolling through. I had no clue whatsoever, as you can probably see. Surmise, this is a complete and total pleasant surprise. Uh, let's see here. Chris Manders, thoughts on Dennis Rodman's WCW run, and does he deserve to be in the celebrity wing of the WWE Hall of Fame? Fucking Rodzilla was funny, man. And hell, why not? If Drew Carey's in the celebrity wing of the Hall of Fame, why not put Dennis Rodman in there? Now, to be fair, I would much rather see somebody like Andy Kaufman get his due and be in there first, especially if the whole death all these years was a fake. Oh, could you imagine? Oh, oh, oh shit. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Uh, Ruck Fools. Do you think they should bring back Money in the Bank to Mania this year? I do. I would prefer. I wish that phone would stop fucking ringing. But I do. I, I wish they would bring Money in the Bank back to Mania. I know it's not realistic. Probably not going to happen. And, you know, I understand. Um, let's see here. One second here. Air 458, what are your thoughts on the concept of the Bullet Club as a whole? I'm going to be honest with you. I really don't pay much attention, and I don't watch Japan wrestling. I could give a shit less. I could give a shit less, and that's the honest truth. So I don't know. I have no idea. Uh, Christian, hey, Schleich Daddy, what do you think of Christoph Porzingis, the Knicks, and the NBA this season? Well, it sucks because, for me, I work second shift. I work 3 p.m. to midnight Eastern, so I have to catch the basketball at work on the TVs here and there, and it, it sucks. You know, I will say this. You know, I think I was pretty big on Porzingis heading into this draft, you know, and how stupid do the 76ers look now for not taking him? I'm just saying, you know, now you've got Noel and Okafor, who don't play very well together in the front court. Porzingis could have played very well with uh, Noel. Uh, Porzingis is the shot in the arm that the New York Knicks organization needed. Frankly, he's the big sporting shot in the arm that the city of New York needed. 
And he's a breath of fresh air and a breath of some life into the biggest media market in the NBA and in this country as a whole. And the thing is, the kid's, what, 19 years old? I can't wait to see what the hell Kristaps Porzingis does next. The Latvian bear. Oh, baby. Porzingis. Porzingis. <laughs> Latvian bear. <laughs> Fucking awesome, dude. He's going to be a major star in the NBA for years. Book it. Uh, Ryan Steele. Did AJ Lee debunk the once you go black, you never go back theory by dating Jay Lethal but marrying CM Punk? <laughs> I guess technically. Uh, what is your overall opinion on Barack Obama's eight years as president, and how do you think he'll be remembered? Um, his eight years have been disappointing to me because I think he came in trying to do too much and trying to please too many masters, if you will, and didn't get a whole lot done. Some of the things that he did, I thought, showed a, somewhat of a lack of leadership and a lack of ability to get people on board and a lack of negotiating skill. I thought his healthcare legislation was a step in the wrong direction while trying to do something good. It ended up being a big giveaway to me anyways, to the insurance industry you know, yes, it technically got more people insured, but you're doing it by the point of a gun. Now, me personally, I still think a single-payer system is something worth exploring, but then you'll have those free market knuckleheads that think that that's the way to go, too. Um, you know, with Obama, I think it's one of these things of expectations unfulfilled. Could have been more, should have been more. I thought his leadership on certain issues was very lacking. I was actually proud of him for taking a stand and issuing an executive action on gun control. You know, he at least tried to do something. I mean, if you're going to do an executive order, at least make it something important. Uh, but I thought he was severely lacking in his leadership in some of the racial upheaval when it came to the police in this country. You look at the Baltimore situation. You look at Ferguson. You know, Barack Obama should have been there. He missed a huge opportunity, and that's one of my biggest disappointments of him. You know, people will talk about all these far-right Fox News talking points, the economy's bad, and it's just all this other shit, and people don't know what the hell they're talking about. Me personally, though, I've been disappointed by him. I was hoping he was going to be an RFK type of guy, or at least a JFK type of guy, and he's going to be somebody probably 20 years from now, He'll be the Democrats' version of Reagan, and he'll be immensely overrated, and people will choose to have creative memories about him. Like, people think Reagan was a great conservative, yet he never balanced a budget. He exploded the size of the government. You know, they, they think he was great for the economy, even though you had all these different scandals that happened in the 80s. You had Iran-Contra, you know. He had all these other mythologies. He helped end the Cold War, yes, by spending us into oblivion so the Soviet Union, who was already crumbling, continued to spend themselves into oblivion. That's something to be proud of. You know. The Obama presidency ultimately left me leaving a, left me wanting a lot more than what it actually got. So I can't sit here and lie and say I'm not disappointed. I don't think he's been very good, but he has been better than Bush, which, again, isn't saying much. And if people say he's worse than Bush, then they're just stupid. They're just stupid. Sorry. That's the way I feel. Um, let's see here. Ahmed, thoughts on the rumors that Hogan might return for WrestleMania? Is it too soon? Is he really going to help them? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm for him, as I talked about in the Triple Threat video that Hulks were apparently responded to. I'm, I'm for him being at WrestleMania. I don't think it's too soon. And I think anytime you incorporate a Hogan, he's going to sell some merch and get some eyeballs on the product. You know, I don't think it'd be bad. Uh, Mex American Martian. I know you don't support Bernie for prize, but can you at least respect the fact he's genuine in his passion? Yeah, but that's kind of a short sighted thing. You know, a lot of these people are passionate about what they believe in. I think Donald Trump has passion for what he believes in, Ted Cruz has passion for what he believes in. Marco Rubio, if you can figure out what he believes in, he has a passion for it. I think Ben Carson has a tremendous amount of passion for what he believes in. This doesn't mean any of them are suited to run the country. You know, I think Bernie Sanders' focus is far too narrow. Again, whether people like this or not, I think we should be exploring age limits for our presidents. 
I don't want fucking angry grandpa running the damn country. And I'm tired of these people in their mid to late 60s, early 70s being president of the United States. And they, they're out of touch. And it's just so many of them have been so far removed from the reality of the everyday man or woman uh, that they don't know how to fix it because how could they? Look, there are things I like about Bernie Sanders. There are things I do admire about Bernie Sanders. But respecting the fact that he's genuine in his passion, that really doesn't say much to me because a lot of these people running for president are genuine in their passion and their belief that they know the way to help the country and that they have a passion for wanting to be president. That's not, not a reason that makes him any better than anybody else, if I could be so honest. Uh, Jacob Castle 42, could you see Bailey becoming the scene of the women's division in terms of merch sales and popularity with kids? No, because I'd have a sense at some point in time that the Bellows would put the screws to her backstage, if anything else. And besides, how was any do you ever going to get over to that point where they could get into that category? Because it's like a revolving door. You get two or three months, you know, they may give you the fucking bell. It's like Kelly Kelly. Everybody has a damn turn and then they move on from you. Jacob Picasso also asked, what in your opinion is the greatest sports rivalry of all time? For me, it's Bird and his Celtics versus Magic and his Lakers. You know, I guess it depends. I'm sure there are great soccer rivalries. I mean, no offense to soccer fans. I don't give a fuck because I don't pay attention. Um, so I'm sure I'm leaving out great soccer rivalries. I'm sure if I ask the Canadian brethren, there are tremendous curling rivalries too. You know, I, I don't know. Um, Bears-Packers used to be a tremendous rivalry, but, um, you know, in recent years, it's been more about Packers-Vikings than it has been Packers-Bears. Uh, you know, the media will tell you that it's Red Sox versus Yankees, and, and that's a great rivalry in and of itself. There's no question about it. You know, there are other rivalries that have their moments in time, those flashes, but they don't, like, have a sustained period. I think of, like, uh... Lakers, Celtics, I mean, that was close to a decade, and then it stretched even more later on. Um, but they didn't play each other a whole hell of a lot either every year until they got to the NBA Finals. You know, you had Bulls, Pistons. I actually like the Bulls and Knicks rivalry even more. Maybe that was because the Bulls pretty much always won it. Um, Cubs, Cardinals for me. You know, you'll talk about the Subway Series with the Mets, Yankees. I don't think that's much of a rivalry. Um, people talk about like Dodgers and Giants, but you know, maybe this is the, the Midwest and East Coast guy. I mean, I don't really see that that much. Uh, Red Wings, Blackhawks, when we're talking about hockey, I think would be a good one. Um, best sports rivalry, though, or greatest sports rivalry of all time? I don't know. I mean, I just... Bird and Magic, maybe. Maybe the Celtics and Lakers organizations as a whole because of the period of time. You could go to Yankees, Red Sox based off of the history. I mean, there's a lot of history there. Uh, people will look at Brady and Manning, and that, and that deserves to be in that conversation. I mean, because these have been two guys that have been vying for the same thing for a decade and a half. I don't know if I could narrow it down to one. Um, Hispanic Titanic. Will Golden State or the Spurs break the Bulls' wins record? And what do you think about each team right now at the halfway point? Um, you know, Spurs would be the team in the West that would be most likely to give Golden State problems. I still think Golden State is a clear-cut favorite in the West and probably at this moment a clear-cut favorite to repeat, but maybe the Cavs could give them a better effort this go-around if they're at full strength. Uh, I don't think the Spurs are motivated by trying to get to 72 and 10 or 73 and 9 and surpassing that 95, 96 Bulls team. They'll rest people. They'll probably end up finishing like somewhere between 64 and 18 to 67 and 15 because Popovich will rest players and everything else. Um, in terms of the Warriors, they've got a shot. Uh, they've got to have good health. Obviously, they can't miss Curry for any point in time. So they have a shot. Does that mean that they're better than the 95-96 Bulls team? No. Does that mean that they would beat them straight up in a NBA Finals Series? Hell no! But my hat's off to them if they find a way to go 73-9 and because I don't care what era of NBA basketball you're talking about. That's pretty special. Uh, and then Duke THS, do you think Sylvain Grenier can still take Pat Patterson? 
Oui, oui. <laughs> Thanks for your questions, guys. I'll see you later. Oui, oui. <laughs>